Kyle here from All Media Reviews, here to do uh, Album of the Year, um, Rough Draft, of course, uh, 1987. Again, uh, you know, a lot of stuff I'm missing, um, probably didn't go over, but it's been a matter of wanting to get these out. And, you know, again, this is a rough draft. Hopefully someday I can do a more uh, complete or more accurate, thorough um, uh, version of it. But um, anyway, so 1987... Um, some stuff that's not on my list, and I've inserted a couple of the stuff at the bottom, of course, that I only know just from reputation, and maybe one song or two, but, so one record that I know, but it's not on my, I didn't put on my list, my, my wife's copy, is Suzanne Vega's, um, uh, what's it called, Solitude Standing, which has her biggest hit, Tom's Diner, and also another one of her hits, Luca, which is kind of a sad track, but, um, I mean, I've talked about that, she has that song, um, it was in the suddenly was it suddenly sleep? one of the soundtracks um, that Joe Jackson co-wrote, but that was just on a, a single. It wasn't actually on the um, on any album. But um, I forget the name of it now. <laughs> Shoot! But Suzanne Vega is an artist I want to get more into, and um, Jake Rude plays her on his show a lot. But anyway, um, that okay. So one I've just come across in the last couple of days might be on the list at some point. It's more like an EP. It's called Shadows as Tall as Trees. Mostly because it's very Tears of Fears like, and it's just like an EP, I guess. But it sounds a lot like Tears of Fears. But Kevin Gilbert, or as known as Kai Gilbert, uh, produced it and played some keyboards, I think maybe, and uh, engineered it. So he was only twenty. He was right in the, when he was known as he was going by Kai Gilbert, um, the Eddie Money period before Giraffe even, I think, had formed. Um, anyway. And then my wife has it over there, but I didn't grab it. Um, Alexander O'Neill's Hearsay, which includes a couple different hits. The biggest probably being uh, Fake. Um, Alexander O'Neill, I think it's his second record. You know, the Minneapolis Sound. Um, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, I think, produced it. But um, it's called Hearsay. Criticize and Never or something was the other, one of the other two big hits. And then uh, Dio's album Dream Evil, which, you know, after Holy Diver, I'm still kind of getting my feet wet with Dio so all right so starting at the bottom here and again some of these records are just um records I know more of just like I knew in the past but I haven't um risen TNT's Tell No Tales I like Intuition more if I have I think it might be on the, the next one will be another year or two but yeah this is I don't know if this is their debut album or second album I don't know if they were from Florida but they were kind of hair metal but they had some kind of Early power metal slash prog metal elements at points that were recommended to me when I got into Fate's Warning, just along with Sanctuary and the Crimson Glory. Um, so number 25, Yes is Big Generator. Uh, I know it has Level Find a Way, and, um, but it's, you know, more of like the full Trevor Raven Yes. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't even have a copy. I thought I did, but I, I'm looking through my CDs and I don't have a vinyl copy, so... Uh, that tells you so much about that. Um, number 24, Roger Waters, Radio Chaos. Roger Waters, I always wanted to get into, and I mean, I didn't pay, I only pay, paid $4 for this. I even got it half off, I can't remember, but. Um, Hitchhikers, uh, Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking and Amuse to Death. I never, Amuse to Death is the one that Patrick Leonard worked on, but I don't know, I, it's like, he's frustrating because I want to like his music. I love, obviously, it was a lot of the Pink Floyd stuff. His solo music is never fully, I've never been attached to, but, you know, I know it's more kind of ambient and plodding along and kind of dreary at points, but, because that's kind of Roger Waters, one of his M his M.O., but anyway. Radio Chaos from Roger Waters, uh, number uh, 20, whatever, it's the second solo album uh, after leaving Pink Floyd, number 24. Or 23, R.E.M.'s Document. I can't remember if it was like Radio Europe was on that. I forget. But anyway, it's one of the more re notable R.E.M. records, but the ones that came after were even bigger, of course, to, to my um, listening experience. Number 20, uh, that's number 23. Number 22, Bruce Springsteen's Tunnel of Love. The title track is what I mostly think of uh, for that one. Um, that was, you know, the Springsteen period after the E Street Band had left. So I can't, that album... And then Lucky Town and uh, Brilliant Disguise and um, Human Touch. Um, I don't know. Tunnel of Love, I just know the title track mostly. I've been thinking about it off the top of my head. I, I never got the CD. That's how much it was. Because, again, it didn't have the Easter. I don't even know if Clarence Clemens was on that record. But Number 21, Faith No More's Introduce Yourself. Uh, this is still the Chuck Mosley Faith No More. I don't think I had We Care A Lot, the first one on my list. I should have. But 
I I am a P Faith No More fan, though admittedly I'm mostly a, a Mike Patton Faith No More fan. But I know when I've listened to Chuck Mosley stuff, I've liked it. It's just I haven't spent as much time with it. Um, it this, this has We Care a lot. And I thought that they had a previous record. I mean, I know Courtney Love, of course, was, was one of their the vocalists originally. He was in the, she was in the band, but I don't think this is their debut album. You know, of course, Mike Patton joined for, with The Real Thing in 89, so I think this is their second record, but... I forget the name of their first record. Anyway, I have this low because it probably would be higher just because I like Faith No More style and they were so inventive. But I haven't listened to this album in a long time and never got around to re revisiting it. So, number twenty, number twenty-one, number twenty, Joe Satriani, "Surfing with the Alien," mostly known for the title track, which was a minor pop hit, instrumental, you know, shredder. Um, I don't know if that was his debut album. That was sort of his coming out party. People got to know him best. But I'm not that big of a Satriani or the G3 stuff. See, Vi. I like Eric Johnson, you know, among those. But he wasn't a, like a staple. It was basically Satriani and, and Vi. Although I'm going to see Vi on the on the beat thing, the King Crimson thing coming up in October. But November, maybe. It's November. Um, number 19. Kind of low, maybe, comparably, but... Uh, Jethro Tull's Crest of a Knave. I'm not that into the 80s Jethro Tull, but of course this won the Grammy, and it does have the song Budapest, which is kind of a, uh, a little bit of an epic, more a little bit in their prog leanings. Uh, Steel Monkey was another one, but I know I ended up getting this from the library years ago, and it's like, well, I'm, I gotta get some more Jethro Tull, and I, you know, I paid almost nine, eight, eight forty for it. Anyway, yeah, it's it's a decent record. I mean, among the the post seventies toll, it probably would be my first or second favorite, sadly. But um, it's this low because I I don't still like I've never gotten attached to it. But I mean, Budapest is the the one track I always think of. But it kind of won the Grammy famously defeating Metallica for best hard rock album. Um, let's see here, number nineteen, number eighteen, Appetite for Good Destruction by Guns N' Roses. Of course, everyone their mothers heard this album and. It, it was a staple of my youth. Bar of parties have always played Sweet Child of Mine, you know, Welcome to the Jungle, Mr. Brownstone, um, you name you know, they, it. Had just, it, was, it was all over the place. And while, like, there's many albums that have been overplayed and over force fed I don't, like, I don't, like, hate it to no end. I just, you know, it's sort of a, a piece of nostalgia. That's pretty much why it has value and it merits to go at least 18th. Number 17, Def Leppard's Hysteria, you know, which the title track is like my favorite Jeff Def Leppard song. Also had Pour Some Sugar on Me, which, you know, those two were, bands and albums were like rivals around that time, um, even though Def Leppard predated Guns N' Roses by a lot. Um, but number 17, Def Leppard's Hysteria. I think it has a few of their other hits, but not all, like Rocket. I can't remember. I mean, I, the Def Leppard history, I don't know. Like, they had Adrenaline. They had a bunch of records. You know, go back to like going back to like the late seventies, early eighties. They were a new wave of British heavy metal band, but their sound was a little different. Um, like sometimes really like their vocal harmonies, but yeah, the title track is the one I, I think of most for that record. Um, I think it was their biggest selling record too. Number sixteen, um, Jimi Hendrix Experience. Show me one of the first ten or twenty CDs I ever bought. I think I got this off the BMG mailing list. Um, Live at Winterland. Uh, you know, it was a recording from. Who was it from? I don't even know. It, it actually says 86 and 87, 80, but anyway. Obviously, I don't even have the compact disc anymore. Um, October 10th, 11th, and 12th, 1968. So, I mean, I have the, the, the stages box set, of course, here. So, you know, this interlaced or crossed over with some of this period. But, I mean, it's got some of the classics. Spanish Castle Magic, Sunshine of Real, the cover, the cream cover. He mentions that after they'd broken up. Um... Tax free, not stone free. Killing floor. Red House is a favorite. Ten minute and fifty eight seconds. That's probably the you get your price of uh, your your price of admission just for that track alone. Hey Joe, Purple Haze, of course, and Wild Thing. I mean, it's not. It doesn't have my ultimate Hendrix set list. There's better stuff on this, but still, it's probably a decent live. It's Jimi Hendrix. It's a decent live record. So I don't want to. Um, maybe someday I'll do a review of that whole that whole box set, that whole stages box that I got when I was in high school. Number 16. Number 15. I don't have the full length, but I, I listened to this today. The Dukes of Stratosphere's full length. I don't have the vinyl, rather. Uh, Sonic Sunspot. You know, when I first tried to get in XCC, I was actually enjoying these guys more. But um, I, I like it, although it's interesting. There's one track. I always liken uh, the Dukes of Stratosphere to be channeling the, the Sid Barrett era Pink Floyd. And I think on 25 O'Clock, the EP, they did that. 
more so than on here. Some on here, but there's a track on here titled um, Shiny Cage. I, it sounds a lot like I'm only sleeping from the Beatles, like totally. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of good tracks on here. I mean, they're not fantastic, but they're good enough. There's charm to them between um, the Vanishing Girl, the opening track, Brainiac's Daughter, the Affiliated... Uh, the affiliate has this really cool bridge and outro. Um, Pale and the Precious has a massive Beach Boys element. You're my drug is very catchy, very catchy and energetic. It's like psych pop. So, yeah, I mean they were doing that, you know. And they, this is be this was pro I think this was at least released, if not it was released, but it was, may have been recorded or written and recorded after Skylarking, because they did the, the first Duke's EP before Skylarking. I don't know how the sequence of events exactly, but. They did Skylarking after they were, like, kind of not having success with, like, the Big Express and um, Mummer. And it's like, well, we may as well just do whatever the hell we want rather than try to write pop hits. And then they they, they had fun doing that. And they're like, no, we want you to, you know, work with Todd Rundgren and we'll, we'll do a, a, a pop album. And it worked. But then they still wanted to go back to the Dukes. So uh, Sonic Sunspot, number 15. Number 14, I don't have a copy. I had it on cassette tape when I was... In high school, I know somewhere. I don't know if I still have it. Jane's Addiction's self-titled live album, which I think of mostly for Jane Says, probably, and um, I think it's a cover of the Zeppelin song Rock and Roll, but um, also Sympathy. That it says Sympathy, I have Sympathy for the Devil, the Rolling Stones song. Um, there's some other tracks on here though. I was looking Pigs and Zen, and I think that's it. Jane Says and Pigs and Zen are, I think, the only two tracks here that ended up on studio records. They only had a couple studio records, but um, the, th the opening track, Trip Away, is good. I mean, I they were a fun live band. It's just interesting how Jane's Addiction's debut release is live. Uh, it's like a, what a jam band would do. <laughs> but, yeah, I've always liked this record, although I, you know, I, I side with their studio records more. But, you know, that that's the trilogy of their proper records. You know, they had a really limited release career, you know. They put out two albums in the last 30 years or whatever, but... Um, which I haven't even heard, actually. I'll, I'll confess. So, all right, number 14... Number 13, that was number 14, Jane's Addiction's self-titled uh, debut album. The album I just bought on vinyl. I'll talk about it when we do Records today. I got it on Records today. Jane Seabury, not Cyberry's, um... I think it's, 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 I think it's Seabury, The Walking, and I'm just, you know, listening to it, take, I've been taking her in here and there the last few weeks, going back a few years, I originally looked, because I knew Kevin Gilbert had covered her song, The Taxi Ride, but, um, this is really good, although it's, a lot of it's subtle, but there's a few real big tracks, the, the closing track is like 10 minutes, The Bird and the Gravel has some weird moments, it's very kind of epic, um, I wrote a whole bunch of notes down. My favorites, otherwise, the, the White Tent, uh, the White Tent, the Raft, Ingrid, and the Footman's really catchy. It's got this yaddy, 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 da, da, da. <laughs> um, kind of ends. You know, it's got this piano and this chanting. It's just great. Um, the title track with piano and vocals. You know, some she extends herself vocally a little bit on that. Um, you know, I, people have compared her to, to um, Kate Bush, of course. And even Joni Mitchell, she's Canadian, so the Joni Mitchell comparisons, I think there's some, she's somewhere in between, and you know, and I'm not that big of a Kate Bush fan, and Joni Mitchell, I, I pick my spots at, but I'm having faith that I'm going to get more into her, but I don't know, I bought some other of her stuff I'll show when we do Record Store Day uh, video, I do, or, or my, my, I, I and my wife do, but yeah, The Walking, it's her best record, I think ultimately it could probably go higher if I do another version of this, but anyway, number 13, Jane... Jane, I want to say her name is uh, Seabury. Seabury is the walking. Um, number 12. So I have two different versions of this. I, I got this a number of years ago. I paid a pretty penny. I don't know how much I spent on it. Halloween is her second record. Second or third record. But the first one was Michael Kisk. Um, Keeper of the Seven Keys, part one. Um, this is part two, actually, I got here. Is this part two? Yeah, that's kind of weird. Because this says, unless I have the wrong jewel case, I put the wrong, yes, interesting. Because this looks the same. So anyway, um, Keep of the Seven Keys Part 1. Um, it's power metal, it's early power metal. I can hear Andre Matos being influenced. They were always comparing him to Michael Kisk. The biggest parts of this are there's one single, that uh, Future World, that, just, that was a radio song. And then the, 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 the track Halloween is epic it's even though it is kind of proggy i mean but 
it, it does kind of set the template for Power Man. I mean, they were influenced by the Scorpions, too. They were German. The Scorpions were German, too, as a little figure. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge Halloween fan, but I have a little bit of a soft spot for getting for the Keeper of the Seven Keys records, especially this one. So, that's number, whatever, number 12. Number 11, we see Sting again with Nothing Like the Sun, which features, uh, probably my favorite song on here is uh, English Men in New York. I believe that's on here, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the track list is kind of weird. Uh, Be Still My Beating Heart, Fragile, um, uh, We'll Be Together was a hit. His cover of Jimi Hendrix's Little Wing. I didn't get around to like revisiting this, though, but I mean, it's pretty good. I would say it's eh, slightly better, maybe, Dream of the Blue Turtles in terms of beginning to end, but um, and just from my memory of of Dream of the Blue Turtles being a little more jazzy, but, um, I don't know, they got Soul Cages and the, uh, Ten Summer's Tale will be the two other records that will be showing up on my list, of course, in the, in the in the near future, but, yeah, I've always liked the songs on here, but again, I haven't listened to this whole record, songs like Secret Marriage and They Dance Alone, um, History Will Teach Us Nothing, I haven't listened to it in a long, I mean, English Man in New York is a, is a, a, a top five, maybe top ten, five, top five Sting songs, so it kind of has to go up there somewhere uh, among my favorite sting stuff um so number 11 number 10 i don't have a physical copy and i haven't been able to listen to the whole thing but i've known it the song the album has to be on here prince's sign of the times which has you got the look which was like a sheena easton thing um uh let's see here i'm going to be a beautiful night was live they referenced the wizard of oz a few times in that those are the notable things it's like a double album it's experimental. I think I, I like it more than a couple of his records that were before this, but um, like like Around the World in a Day, perhaps. I mean, it didn't have as many... The, the hits weren't as big, but um, they had it for sale for like 80 bucks at the record store the other day on Saturday, but I don't know. It's anointed as maybe his best or second best record, and I think it's a work in progress for me, whether I'll consider Sign of the Time at that level, but it's number 10 for a reason because it's still Prince. I and mean, I, I got through about two-thirds of it the other day and then it wasn't able to finish listening to it all right number nine i mean it's kind of weird because you'd be putting like sting and halloween ahead of it for that reason but um number nine sabotage hollow mountain king and i revisited this the title track i've, I've always liked um it you know it 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 has like that song um strange winds that is super catchy it sounds like mtv hair metal like what it was made for it it's it's a banger of course it has prelude to madness which is an arrangement of the grieg the classical compo composers um in the hall of the mountain king that was a, a, a whole composition that that the composer did um from the from the pier gent suite so um it's epic i mean there really isn't a bad song on here it's a big step up from you know sirens and um there are other records that preceded it but power of the night uh power of night um yeah, I, I mean, among the John Oliva 80s records, I kind of still lean toward this. Love the energy, sort of the the force and the, the kind of majestic element to this record. And, you know, Oliva extending himself, and it sometimes really works, especially on the title track. The title track is prog metal, really. So, Hall of the Mountain King from Sabotage, number nine. I mean, it could have been a little bit higher, but... Um, number eight, the uh, second Paul, Pat Metheny group album with Paul Wertigo, Still Life Talking, and... I had the CD for a long time, but I haven't gone back to it in a long time. And I, got, I found this, another thing I found on Records Store Day, um, paid a little bit of a pretty penny for it, but um, it's got a couple fingerprints, but it looked like it's in reasonable shape. But um, it's got a couple of just bangers, and that's what I was looking for. I mean, of course, it has uh, Paul Wertigo, who I love, but Ninuano, Ninuano, the first track. Um, and then, what is it? There's six, is it six, eight? Six eighth, the other band. There's uh, Minuano Six Eight. That's the name of the track. Um, and then Third Wind. Though that is channeling some of the same stuff I loved on um, with the chanting and everything, the ethnic chanting without the words that they did on on, on um, First Circle, which is a it was my album of the year from 1984. So, yeah, still live talking. Uh, it's not my favorite Pat Metheny, but given it, I've revisited now. It, it would definitely be higher if i if ever did like a pat metheny rankings video i should just isolate the pat metheny group rankings rather these are the pat metheny that i love so anyway not number number eight number seven 
Pink Floyd's momentary lapse of reason it had to go somewhere. Um, I like this because it's a David Gilmore soul album. I, I grew up, this is the Pink Floyd that I was first introduced to, uh, Learning to Fly, which I still think holds up. I mean, it is sort of FM radio, adult contemporary sounding at points, but it still works. Dogs of War, I can take or leave. One slip I've always liked. Um, the New Machine, Terminal Frost, Sorrow is a, a favorite. They even reference that in the Shadow Gallery, uh, Floating Memories medley. So it's Pink Floyd. I mean, it's and it's great that they did something more after the parting ways with Roger. I mean, is it really Pink Floyd? Is it David Gilmore? Um, but yeah, Momentary Lapse of Reason is sort of, it's my generation's Pink Floyd, of, you know, if you want to call it that. Um, and I've always liked it. I always had sort of a soft spot, even though it has an 80s element and like a new wave element to it. Um, I still enjoy a lot of it. And I'm a big Pink Floyd fan, so I can't really get past that. Um, so number six, I actually have the cassette right here too. And this is my wife's, one of my wife's many copies. George Michael or Jorge Miguel's Faith. It was just filled with pop bangers. It was a coming after he left Wham and everything like that. It was just, it had like six top tens and like three or four number ones. My go-to is Monkey. That's the one I like the most. I mean, the, the title track is he's like doing an Elvis thing and kind of sounds like that one song from Ario Speedwagon. But um, yeah, Faith, Faith. We played that in band when I was in grade school. Um, you know, One More Try, the vocal performance is great. Um, Kissing a Fool. You know, I mean, everyone knows I want your sex and father figure, of course. You know, it, it's a really well-produced record. I don't know if it's my, f if I'm choosing one George Michael record, my, my wife doesn't lean toward this, but there's no denying its importance, its influence, and it was massive. And, you know, it still holds up, you know, especially. So, um, number six. Number five, I don't have a copy at this point either, but In Excess is Kick. I think I had it on cassette, because when I was listening to cassette tapes, about 10 years ago in my car, I bought that, among others. But this is filled with pop bangers. I, this is an absolute 80s pop pop rock classic. I mean, In Excess had some other records that I still need to revisit and get more familiarity with. But between New Sensation, Never Tear Us Apart, Devil Inside, uh, Mediate, Guns in the Sky, Wildlife, uh, almost all those songs were radio staples. And, you know, of course, Michael Hutchins was a, just an amazing vocal talent and songwriter. Um, yeah, kick is a great, great, in fact, having it at number five might be a little bit low. So anyway, so number four, of course, MJ, bad, you know, the follow-up to Thriller finally happened, you know, when you were growing up in the 80s, it's like Thriller came out in 82, it took five years. Um, but I didn't really pay attention that closely, and I actually didn't get Thriller probably until like 83 or 84 sometime. But it was a big deal, it's a really big deal when this album came out. And Quincy Jones worked with him again, of course. It has a lot of pop bangers. Bad, the title track, you know, uh, Man in the Mirror, Smooth Criminal, and Dirty Diana. Um, those are among others, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a staple, and it lives up to sort of the, the praise. I think in some ways it doesn't get enough credit, although I still would lean toward Thriller between the two of them. But, I mean, it's about as good. It's about as good as Thriller to me. So, I mean, some of the, the, the deeper tracks, like Liberian Girl, Just Good Friends... Uh, another part of me. You know, oh, I forgot to mention the way you make me feel. That was another pop banger. So Speed Demon. I, you know, I haven't listened to as much, but um, I mean, my favorite Michael Jackson song is not on either the Thriller or this actually. But you know, I don't know if I'll be getting to that at the point. <laughs> it's Michael Jackson doing Prague. It only happened a few times. But um, number four, number three, another huge pop banger. You choose the Joshua Tree, which, you know, I've heard. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I'm with without you probably more times than I need to. They're kind of like Tom Sawyer and uh, Limelight or Rock and Roll and Black Dog. But I, I still think Where the Streets Don't Have No Name holds up. But the reason why this is number three, beyond those songs still being good enough, um, it songs like Red Hill Mining Town. I, I need to, I can barely read this. Red Hill Mining Town is, is a fantastic track. Um... Bullet, to, Bullet the Blue Sky is awesome. Running to Stand Still. Um, and the song Exit. I wrote that down when I was listening to it the other day. I did not. But, um, yeah, I mean, the production, the Daniel Lenoir production just works so well. U2, is, this is peak U2. I mean, I still probably lean toward Unforgettable Fire, but it's like Bad and Thriller, you know? It's like 1A and 1B. Push comes to shove, I probably would still go with Unforgettable, but this is damn close. And then, you know, Octoon Baby followed it, and... I was thinking about the other day. I actually think I might like Octoon Baby but better than both of them now. I don't know. Find out when I get to that. And so I was 91, I believe. So number two, Rushes Hold Your Fire. Obviously uh, not 
not everyone's favorite Rush album, even their favorite from the 80s or the synth period, but I consider this to be about as good as uh, the albums that surrounded it. Um, the deeper tracks, especially. Um, Time Stand Still is probably the biggest song on here, but and I still love that song. Amy Mann did the, the, the harmony vocals, of course. Um, Lock and Key, Prime Mover, Second Nature, and Open Secrets, and, and Force 10. There's like five of the first six tracks are just banger. I don't mind Mission, Turn the Page is okay. And I don't really hate Ty Shan or High Water. I know people, including the band, don't like those songs. Didn't like those, like Neil himself. But it's pretty. It's not a perfect record, but it's pretty close. Again, I, I think the best songs on on Power Windows are better. But in terms of depth, they're about an even match. And I would say the, the same thing about the next record, actually, because um, I have a soft spot for all the '80s Rush albums, including that. And go 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 figure. What is number one? No surprise. Marillion's Clutching at Straws. Slightly my favorite. Fish era record, my second favorite Marillion record. Um, I talked about it on the the prog stream of Marillion a few weeks ago. Hotel Hobbies, Warm It Circles, that time of the night. There's not a better like opening three tracks on any album in history to me. Uh, it's so good. The passion is just through the roof. Um, Sugar Mice, of course. Slan Vaunt, whatever it's called. I always always said it's slant, slant my half. Um, Torch Song, White Rush. And I mean, some of it gets kind of dark, literally talking about, you know. In, in internment camps and Nazis and stuff like that. You know, Fish was sort of, this was the peak of his lyrics, but, you know, he was kind of feeling the effects of the band and um, not you know, the whole fame and rock star lifestyle not working out, and he's drawing himself in, in booze and everything like that at the bar, but it just create you know, misery created creativity and genius. So um, I've talked about this so much. It's a perfect record. It's an epic record. It's it's almost, you know, spiritual in a lot of ways. I mean, Brave one-ups it a little bit, but I sometimes think this is my favorite thing they've ever done. So so that's it for 1987. Hopefully I'll get to 1988 soon. I'm sure I missed a lot. Like I said, someday, in six months, a year or two from now, I'll probably redo this and be a little more thorough. But thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.